this video, I'm going to be building the best budget gaming PC for 2022, featuring an RTX 3050, 12th gen Core i3, and loads of other great hardware that doesn't break the bank. If 1080p gaming in the latest titles is what you're after, this is the build for you. I'll be walking you through all the component choices, the build process step by step, before looking at detailed performance benchmarks later on. Let's do this. As with all of our builds on the GeekerWatt channel, we're going to start things off by looking at the motherboard and the CPU first of all. This combination is quite possibly the best budget CPU and motherboard combo that exists right now. Intel's Core i3-12100F with 4 cores, 8 threads and absolutely heaps of performance in the latest titles. It's the perfect chip for the likes of Fortnite, Apex Legends and even new titles like Halo Infinite, ticking all of our boxes. I'll be installing it into the Asus Prime B660M A D4. <laughs> Not the catchiest of names from Asus, but thankfully the motherboard is absolutely superb. It's technically one of the more basic motherboards out there, but it still packs a punch. With support for the latest Intel processors, four RAM DIMM slots for dual channel memory and future RAM upgrades, high speed USB on the rear IO and USB-C as a front panel connector. It's got all of the features we could want. Plus support for RAM and CPU overclocking also means you can bag yourself some free performance if that's what you're looking to do. Perhaps best of all though is how good of a value proposition this is. And as always latest pricing and availability can be found at the links in the description below. We're going to pull up the arm on our CPU socket and then pull up the cover itself. Next up, locate the golden triangle on the processor. Ours is just here in the bottom left hand corner. And we're going to line this up with the corresponding one on our motherboard CPU socket. We're then going to close the cover back down first of all, applying a bit of force with our finger, which will make the black plastic cover slot off. And then we can secure it back down with the arm. Slightly different to Intel's last generation lineup, a bit more complicated, and the socket's definitely a bit more delicate. We've learned that one the hard way. Now, one of the key advantages of the new Intel processors is the new and upgraded included stock cooler. Now, typically in a build, you'd need to go out and spend 30, 40, or even like $80 on an aftermarket unit. But Intel include one for free that does more than a good enough job. Don't get me wrong, there are a few more frames per second to be had with a more expensive aftermarket unit. And we'll link some good options below. But for those of you shopping on a budget, like me in this build, this is going to work great. It does come with pre-applied thermal paste if brand new, but because we've used mine before, we're going to drop a dab of our own on to create a nice thermal bond between the cooler and the processor. Click it in corner by corner, straight through the four holes on your motherboard, and that's basically it. Intel make this super simple and great for a first time builder. A good but slightly scary test to make sure it's on okay is to pick the cooler up and if the motherboard comes with it, you know you're good. Give it a bit of a wiggle and you're all good to go. For those of you saying, James, this is a very dangerous thing to do. So is installing your motherboard with a cooler that's going to fall off later once a graphics card and other pricey components have joined the party, so to speak. What we're going to do once we've done that is move on to the RAM or the memory. Now, when I talked about the motherboard, you may have heard the letters D and the number 4. Now, D4 basically means the board supports DDR4 memory rather than the newer DDR5. Now, this might seem counterintuitive. Why are we using older memory in a new build? To put it simply, DDR5 is a technology just isn't very mature yet. And it's very expensive per gigabyte, something which DDR4 isn't. And something which our 3050 and even up to like a 3070 isn't going to make any difference. We need to pull back the clips on the end of our dims on the top side. The bottom ones are just static connectors and then slide the RAM into place. This Corsair Vengeance kit is slightly lower profile, has a nice bit of RGB up top and all in all works super well for the build. Looking absolutely fantastic and doing a great job when paired up with our nice i3. We're nearly there when it comes to the motherboard, but there is one more thing left to go, and that's the storage. For this build, XPG's Spectrix S20G. I would recommend a one terabyte drive, as personally for me, it's enough for my favorite six or seven games, Windows and all the other gubbins. But if you're someone who likes to have a large 30 game title library, add in a hard drive as well for additional mass storage, and maybe drop the size of the SSD down so it's just big enough for Windows and your most favorite games. 
To install the SSD, we need to take a look at this here, the M.2 PCIe Gem 4 slot. It supports the latest standard of drives, but once again, we've cheaped out a little bit. Gone for something that's still gonna deliver more than two gigabytes per second, as far as read and writes are concerned, but doesn't break the bank. Speedy Windows boot up times with a wallet that hasn't been annihilated is always a win-win in my book. We won't actually be returning the M.2 heat shield into place as our drive has got its own. In fact, it's got a nice bit of RGB diffusion up top as well with this brushed aluminium aluminum heatsink that looks gorgeous. You can control the RGB too directly through Asus Aura Sync, making things nice and simple. Slide your drive in at sort of a 45 degree angle. There we go, got there in the end. Push it down and screw it in with the same screw we just removed from the motherboard. That's our CPU, memory, motherboard and storage all complete. And we can move on to the case before looking at the GPU. A component I know you're all waiting for. We're gonna get there. Nice and patient. Why am I whispering? <laughs> Dancers freaked out. Moving on to the case, and I've gone for Techware's Nexus M2 for two simple reasons. One, it's very cheap, and two, it's built quite well considering it's very cheap. And that makes it perfect for a build like this, where to be honest with you, we want as much money left at the end of the day for our GPU and CPU, components that are gonna have a direct impact on performance. In fact, we recently published a video talking about just how much you should spend on your next gaming PC and how to pick the right GPU for you. So go and check that one out in the card section now because it's doing actually quite well. So thanks guys. What I recommend you do with any case, no matter how small or how big in fact, is to take off as many of the side panels as you can. For us today, that means the rear steel panel and the front glass panel. As it happens, the front case facade can stay on for now as we don't need access to those fans or anything like that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna lay the case down flat on the table because it's gonna make the next stage of the build so much easier. In particular, that next stage involves taking our motherboard and popping it into the case. Now, before you go all gunko and you whack your motherboard in and you start screwing things down, there's a few things we need to check. And these are quite important. The first is whether your motherboard has a built-in rear I.O. shield. If it comes with a piece of metal like this, it doesn't. And we need to install this now. So we're going to pop this into the rear rectangular cutout on the case. It clips in corner by corner and it can be quite sharp, so be careful. Having this built into your motherboard is a huge bonus if you've got it, but not a deal breaker, especially for a more budget-oriented system. We then need to go ahead and locate each of the standoff holes on the motherboard. You can see here we've got three on the top, three along the middle, and then two along the bottom on different height levels in our situation. We need to cross-reference this against which standoffs are already installed in the case. This makes sure our motherboard is A, properly supported, and B, isn't going to grind out on standoffs that are in the wrong places. We've got two at the top that look good, but we need to add one more just here. We've only got one along the middle for some reason, so we need to add one in the middle and then one on the right-hand side of that middle row. And then the two on the bottom look to be in the right places. Note, this standoff here is installed lower than the other hole, lining up with our motherboard. Extra standoffs are gonna make contact with the motherboard in a bad way, and you do not want that to happen. Go ahead and add in any standoffs you're missing or take out ones that you don't need before sliding the board in, popping those ports through the rear IO and screwing it into place. Nice and easy and make sure our motherboard is installed a-okay. Looking great, that paves the way for us to move on to the PSU, the next part of this build. Now picking a power supply for a budget build is actually quite difficult. On the higher end, you'll just pick up a 7, 850 watt unit for $120 or so. But at this price point where saving every penny counts, it's a much more nuanced and tricky choice. I've gone for Corsair CX650F as it strikes a good balance between reliability, a reputable manufacturer, efficiency ratings, but also, of course, price point. This power supply also has just a hint of RGB built in, which is pretty ridiculous, to be honest with you, but looks cool and will be a nice little addition to the case. You're also not particularly paying much more money for the pleasure, which is always a bonus. It's also fully modular, meaning we only plug in the cables we actually need to use, which for us today includes a 24-pin motherboard power connector, the largest cable of the bunch, a dual 6 plus 2 pin PCIe power connector with two of these 6 plus 2 pin sort of 8 pin total connectors on them, a SATA power harness which are these really thin SATA cables. We're not going to be using these for any obviously SATA drives but they will work for a SATA hard drive if you've got one of those. Instead they're going to work for fan controllers, RGB hubs and all that good stuff. Even if you don't use it it's good to just pop it in your modular interface as you probably will want to take advantage of it at some point in the future. Finally, we've then also got this nice little eight pin or four plus four pin CPU power adapter. That means it splits from a total of eight pins into two four pin chunks for lower power builds and lower power motherboards. 
You can go in this case for a fan up or down orientation as there's mesh on both sides. If you're gonna put this on a table long term, I'd say fan down for pulling fresh air in from under the case. But if it's on a carpet or a rug, put fan up. That way you'll always get air to your power supply, stopping it from overheating and probably exploding in the long run. That is not at all to suggest that Corsair power supplies blow up. As far as I'm aware, they don't. But any power supply needs air, so keep that in mind. And don't starve your PSU of all that juicy, kind airflow. We're then going to go ahead and plug up the CPU power connection to the top left of the motherboard. That's our 4 plus 4 pin connector. And the motherboard power cable to the right hand side while we're here. It also makes sense to do some of the front panel cables at this point. They're basically all your buttons and connections on the top of the case. The ones that help you plug in memory sticks or turn the PC on for that matter. These include our USB 3 connection, which is keyed the biggest of the bunch and actually quite delicate, so be careful. HD audio, which goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, powering up the headphone and mic jacks for, of course, HD audio quality. And then finally, our JFP1. These are our pins that work our power and reset buttons. Uh, if you get these wrong, all that will probably happen is your reset button will turn the PC on and your power button will reset your PC. <laughs> so if you do get them wrong, don't worry. Nothing mega huge will happen. You've just got to go back and put them in the right place. Hopefully the on-screen diagram though will help you out just a little bit at this stage of proceedings. What we are going to do now though with that done is we're going to move on to the GPU, the final component of the build today. The new RTX 3050 was the perfect fit for this system and I've been keeping my beady eyes on pricing and availability all around the world. Here in the UK though, Zotac's twin edge design, the card we've finally managed to get into the studio today, is the best value 3050 that exists. So much so in fact, that at eBuyer here in the UK, you can buy this for a sliver over 300 pounds. And international results don't vary all that much either. Obviously, some countries are better or worse affected than others. But in the UK, the US and Canada, you can buy a 3050 for a price that isn't ridiculous. A price that's really quite near MSRP. This Zotac design is just a perfect balance. It's got a nice two fan cooler, keeping the card nice and chilly, with some heat pipes to make sure heat is dispersed nice and easily. A metal backplate gives it a nice premium edge, while three display ports and a HDMI 2.0 on the rear panel give us all the connectivity we could want. A single eight pin power adapter and some factory overclocks give us a nice performance boost from, well, the factory. And otherwise, it's just a great option. 1080p gaming, 60 FPS, check out these performance figures, but don't check them out too hard because we're going to look at them in more detail later in this video and I wouldn't want you leaving anytime soon. Now in our case today you can see we've already got some of those PCIe covers at the back removed but we need to make sure these are the right ones to have removed. So we can hop the card over the slot and that looks a-okay to me. Spin the case around and undo this thumb screw at the rear. This is what's holding on our sort of well, that. <laughs> this is what's holding on our PCIe cover, and we're going to take out this spare screw too, before sliding the GPU into place and clicking it into the motherboard. Nice and easy. Fasten it down with a couple of those screws, give it an 8-pin PCIe power connector, and job's quite literally a good one. The PC, in fact, is basically finished. Can you believe it? What we're going to do next is we're going to test this PC out in a wide range of titles, looking at what frame rates we're able to achieve from a system quite so cheap. But first, let's see how it looks when it's all powered up in an epic glam montage in the typical Geekawatt style. I'll see you in a second, but first, roll that montage. <laughs> Nicely done. Now that we've seen how good this system looks, and I'm personally a huge fan of how the twin edge cooler looks on our 3050, it's time to make sure the performance stacks up. We're going to be looking at a wide variety of titles in the benchmark section, everything from GTA 5 to Apex Legends and Fortnite. But before any of that, a summary of all the results, including our temperature testing, which you can find on your screen now. We tested over 15 of the latest and most popular games to make sure the build really cuts the mustard as far as performance is concerned. And I'm glad to report that initial results were very strong. We're going to look at some of these titles in closer detail. GTA 5 is the first of those, where we gamed at 10 80p high settings. We managed to pull in 145 frames per second on average, with 135 and 112 for the 90 and 99th percentiles. This was tested in the in-game benchmark mode. 
Moving on to Battlefield 2042 at 1080p, here we used high settings and enabled DLSS. This gave us 95 frames per second on average, with 87 and 79 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Moving on to Forza Horizon 5 next up, 1080p high was once again the order of the day, and here we got 95 frames per second. So not quite 100 FPS, but not far off with this SOTAC 3050 stacking up very comparably to the MSI 3050 design we recently tested. Next up is Apex Legends. Here we once again tried 1080p high settings, and this time did surpass 100 FPS. 126 frames per second to be precise. 114 and 99 rounded out our results, and as ever, our frame rate was gathered using both Nvidia FrameView and MSI Afterburner's Revertuner. In Fortnite, we tested at 1080p competitive settings, tuning everything down to low, setting the render distance to far and hoping for the best. And all that hoping and praying wasn't quite needed because we got 195 frames per second. This was slightly more than on the MSI 3050 2 fan card we tested a couple of weeks back, though Fortnite can be quite temperamental when it comes to frame rate anyway. Finally, to wrap things up, we tested Call of Duty's Warzone at 1080p and the multiplayer Battle Royale with DLSS enabled at 1080p high. We pulled in just shy of 105 frames per second with 90 and 99th percentile results that show consistent frame rates. Frames that didn't really waver irrespective of where we were in the game. And with that, that pretty much wraps it up for this one. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a big old like rating, get subscribed to see more from us, and as always, we'll see you in the next one. I hope.